Tamika, did you sell the first screenplay that you wrote? Uh, I did, and I would use sell loosely. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, it's called Jar by the Door. The best piece of advice I got during that time was from my girlfriend at the time. And she said, you should just write a movie and then sell it to a studio. And then you can find out how it all really works. And that's why I wrote my first script. And I guess because of me thinking of it that simply, I was able to sell my first script. <laughs> like maybe that's why, I don't know. I mean, it's not, it's obviously not that easy, but in my head it was. And so I wrote this thing and we got it out and done. I was really, really um, grateful that I was validated right away. Most screenwriters don't really get that validation. They have to sort of get it from their family or their friends or a teacher or someone, but that kind of validation came really quickly for me. I, um, I won a contest and it was like $10,000 and it helped move me to LA and I um, optioned the script two or three times. So it was kind of keeping me um, alive. You know, it's like $5,000 yeah. for each option, which was a lot a few years ago. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so um, that was amazing. And then I actually sold the script in quotes. I sold the script for six figures. I it's had a books, so. friend uh -huh. who was an aspiring writer and he had final draft. So I went to him and I said, hey man, I wanna write a script. And he was like, you want what? <laughs> I said, just give me the final draft, show me how it works. He's like, that's not how final draft works. I was like, dude, whatever, just, you know, I just, just show me how it works. So he taught me how it works. He's like, you just do that and hit the tab and then write the thing. I was like, all right. He's like, what are you gonna write? I'm like, I don't know, I just wanna write a script. And write a script. But you didn't have an idea. Not it was at the like time. Like floating around now. Mm -hmm. No, I was like, I'm just gonna write one. I didn't read them all my life. Can't be that hard. Right. Hard, but <laughs> I just figured, just write a script. Just start. Like, what? What am I doing? I'm sitting here. I'm staring at a phone. It doesn't ring. You know, phone's not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I could be sitting here a year from now, and. Me and my phone can be hanging out together, or I could be sitting here a year from now, me and my phone could be hanging out with a script that I wrote. So I started writing. Yeah, there's no other way to put it. <laughs> the check wasn't good. <laughs> it's like the check was, uh, it was a rubber check. And it was really, it was kind of devastating because I had worked with these people for about three or four years. They had literally optioned the script twice, two or three times before. And so I'd probably already made about 15 to 20 grand from this company. So of course there was no reason for us to think right. that this check wouldn't be good. And um, so we got the check. My manager was like, okay, just hold on it to it for a day or two. You know, it's just, just to be sure, blah, blah, blah. They said, hold on it. They want to make sure the money is in there. And then a day became a week and then a week became two weeks. And I was like, well, what's going on? And he's like, I'm not sure, but I'm not sure if that check is going to clear. They're having some issues with their financier or whatever. And I was like, oh my God, you're kidding me. Of course, I had already spent this money in my mind. And it was the perfect scenario. I was going to get to direct it. I was going to get a producer credit. It was going to change my life. <laughs> and uh, it, just never, it just never cleared. And um, I thought that, you know, if someone asked me today, if they say, well, would you change that? I would say no, because it sort of pushed me into a whole other amazing thing that I created. So after that, I just did a lot of soul searching and I thought, well, is this what it, is it this all I'm supposed to be doing with my life, trying to sell my script, trying to do this? There's got to be more to it. So I started to um, uh, mentor and teach and I totally fell in love with uh, demystifying the filmmaking process for kids. And so someone asked me, if you could do anything, what would you do? And I said, aside from filmmaking, I grant uh, wishes to the kids in the Make-A-Wish Foundation because I, I really admired uh, that organization. So I thought, hey, maybe I could get, can combine these two things. And I created Make-A-Film Foundation, which grants film wishes to kids who have serious or life-threatening medical conditions. And this never would have happened 
if I hadn't, you know, if that check wasn't bad and I cashed that check, I would have had a whole different color to my career. But I mean, I've done so much and created so many films with these kids. And I mean, it's just, I wouldn't change it. So I mean, I just wouldn't change it. So um, it it was just a lesson and this is what you think you want. And every, you know, just because it seems like it's a bad thing, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is. It maybe it's just sending you in another direction that you're that is really your true calling and what you're meant to do. I was like, I just want to figure out something that will work. And at the time, it was like uh, you had all these uh, like uh, it was like the teen stuff was hot. So this is like post Scream. This is like Cruel Intentions and, you know, I Know What You Did Last Summer when the lights went off in Georgia or whatever. (laughs) Uh, So I was like, all right, so they're making this stuff and everything was in high school. So I was like, okay, I'll put something in college. All right, what's the story? They all seem to be horrors and thrillers. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. (laughs) So I started looking at films that were really, really popular, like in the 80s. Take that story, that basic idea, set it in college now. (laughs) Now I got a thing that's just a proven track record that works, but then I got this other thing and it's new and it's fresh and it's different. And that became the first script. That became I Would Die For You. It was about a guy going to Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara and had a girlfriend and life was good and a buddy of his in his hometown was getting married. So he goes back to his hometown for the wedding without his girlfriend because she was off doing whatever and uh, he runs into his ex-girlfriend from high school and she and he end up, you know, and uh, he leaves, he says, you know, it's a mistake, whatever, it's good to see you, he goes back to his life, and you see Santa Barbara, turns around, there's the ex-girlfriend. Hey, how are you, what's up, is this your girlfriend? Oh my God, she's so great. Now the girlfriend loves the ex-girlfriend, and he's in hell, and that became, that became I Would Die For You, and uh, Columbia bought that up, <laughs> we had a good time with it, it was fun. You started writing it, I think you showed it to some family members. Yes, I showed it to my brother and he was like, no, you have to write it yourself. And I did and then he gave me some feedback and I implemented all of his notes, even though they were prickly. (laughs) Uh, I was prickled, (laughs) but I still, (laughs) I uh, implemented all of his notes and uh, he read it again. He like was like, thumbs up, he loved it. But then I didn't really know what to do with it. So he was like, well, why don't you just try submitting it to, you know, some places, you know, there wasn't really the whole go online type of thing happening at the same level as it is now. What year was this? It was uh, 97, 98. So I just did some research and I found out about like the Sundance Screenwriting Lab and um, I submitted it to a few contests um, like the Nichols Fellowship and um, I got like incredible feedback, right? It was really great. I was a finalist for Sundance. This is like right off the bat. I didn't even know wow. what Sundance was. I I did this stuff in a way that was so naive. <laughs> it's like I was just doing it. I didn't know anything. I would like send stuff out to Hollywood. I had no agent, no manager. I didn't even know what that stuff was or how you get one or even that I needed one. I would just blindly, you know how they say now, no, uh, we don't accept unsolicited material and all that. I would just send stuff, <laughs> send stuff out. But it actually worked for me. I ended up getting incredible responses and feedback and I started setting up meetings. This is after, like I did win one of those contests. I won the Gordon Parks Independent Film Award and it had like this huge prize, like $10,000. And I used that to eventually to move to LA. But because, but I had um, made all these connections just completely out of the blue because I didn't know any better. I had made all these connections. I would write to people, oh my God, yes. We would type. I would type the letters on like a word processor. Oh, wow. Crazy. Like a selector. Word process, yes. yeah. <laughs> and then I would send the letters out. And so I'd get, like I have actual real letters of like responses from people. And, um, you know, of course there's the, the big huge pile of rejection letters, but I actually had 
a pretty significant pile of letters where people responded to me. And, and it was weird. I'm like, when I think about it now, I'm like, oh, they don't do that anymore. <laughs> but back then, it was really kind of, you know, I thought that's how you did it. You did it yourself. And um, so I would say, yeah, getting back to that actually to a certain degree is kind of where my head is. And what I would say to screenwriters is like, even when you get a manager or something like that, you still have to be in control of your career. You still have to do stuff, network, meet people, and all that kind of stuff, because you're literally laying a foundation that is gonna pay off. I had, you know, I've had meetings with people from those blind letters that I, queries that I sent out after I won the uh, Gordon Parks and I had was like a finalist in Sundance. I mean, I could put something in the letters like, yeah. oh, my script was a Sundance finalist or whatever, but I didn't have much more. It was the only script I had written, you know? But um, it was something. And so these people would meet with me. So when I came out to LA, I had like 10 or 15 meetings set up with people just from just, you know, I didn't know any better. <laughs> I didn't have a manager, no agent, nothing. How long did it take you to write it? <sighs> I hate this question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's good, it's good, it's good. Uh, three weeks. Three weeks, wow. Yeah. How many drafts did you do? Before I sold it? Mm -hmm. <sighs> three, maybe four. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't a lot. I didn't do a lot of drafts. Because I didn't know any better, I probably just bumbled my way into some success. <laughs> you know, I wasn't, but you know what, let's, let's take that back to what you said. I wasn't afraid because I didn't know that I should be afraid. So it's completely connected to what you just said. If I had known that you're not supposed to do it that way, right. then I wouldn't have, but I didn't know. You know, I didn't know that you're supposed to have a manager and you can't submit unsolicited material and this and that. And I just didn't know. I just did it because I didn't have any other way. I didn't know how, how else are you going to do it? You just look in that big book, the Hollywood, that's what it was. Remember the Hollywood Creative Directory? You guys remember that? Uh, it was a big of. old thick book. They, it's online now. Okay. But it was like $65 and it literally listed yes. all the okay. managers, mm -hmm. the producers, the production companies. So someone gave me a tip, I don't remember who, and they were like, you should get this book and you should just uh, send your letters out to any production company or producers or managers in here. So that's what I did. I just went through it wow. and I looked and see, you know, okay, who likes, um, is there anybody here who does any kind of um, uh, uh, diverse material or is there anybody here who does like ensemble indie work, you know, that kind of stuff. So I ended up sending it to places like the shooting gallery. Remember the shooting gallery? That was Sling Blade back in the day. Okay. <laughs> Do you remember oh, yeah. uh, Billy Bob Thornton? Oh yeah, Blade? oh absolutely. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think they were, he was discovered through the shooting gallery and so there's like these little, back then, oh, I wish we had that now, but they had all these little baby independent companies that would do really great stuff. You know, I guess they went bankrupt, but, <laughs> but I wish they would do it again. Yeah, you know, I the really interesting thing. stuff, right? Then, yes, I was still sort of making a, a living as an actor. You know, and you know, yeah, I, there were, by that time I had done Murder One and NYPD Blue, so there were like really healthy residuals floating around. Um, like a residual for Murder One one year, not a year, it was like one day I just went, there was a residual, it was like $15,000 for Murder One. I was like, whoa, oh, I bought a car, it was great. Um, so that was where that was at that time. Um, and I had a friend who was a comedian and he had a buddy who was a manager, a literary manager. And I called my comedian friend up, his name's Ahmed, Ahmed Ahmed. And he says, hey man, I, said, I got the script, man. I'm, I think it's really good, I wanna sell it. He's like, you should call Brian, dude. Brian's a manager now, you should call him up, give him your script, see what he can do. I was like, okay, so I sent it to Brian. And Brian was like, so what do you wanna do? I was like, dude, I don't care. Like, I don't care if they wanna turn it into pigs on the moon, it'll be pigs on the moon. I don't care, I just wanna sell the thing. I, I wanna find out how it works, because nobody will tell me how it works. This whole thing, so I can find out how everything works. He's like, all right, cool. So he sat, he read it, gave me some notes, went back and forth through the notes. Um, and so then once he was happy with it, he decided to do like a soft, what do they call it? Not pitch. 
when the agents and managers, they send it out. I don't know, soft send out, I don't know. It's, they have a name for it, I can't remember. But he sent it out to a few people as opposed to like a blanket thing, you know. Because usually, you know, you, you go wide with it. You send it out to all the studios and all the production companies and you see who bites. So he's like, I'm gonna send it out to people I know first. See what they think, see how it plays, and then we'll go bigger. I was like, all right, cool. So at the time, there was a production company. I cannot remember the name of the production company. They had a deal at Warner Brothers, and the executive at the production company was Channing Dungey. And Channing is actually now, I believe she's the head of drama at ABC now. Um, but she read it, and she was like, this is good. I like this. I want to go out with it. And she did the same thing Brian did. She was like, I'm not going to go wide. I'm just going to, I got a friend. I'm going to see how it plays. So she sent it to a woman named Carrie Richmond. And Carrie was an executive at Columbia, at Sony. So she took it to Carrie. And Carrie read it. And Carrie was like, I like it. It's good. Has anybody else seen it? She's like, no, nobody's seen it, not yet. I'll tell you what. We're going to make a preemptive thing. We're going to make an option, and let's do it. Wow. And we did it, and that's how the first one happened. See? I didn't want to be vague about it. That's how it actually right, happened. Right. Thank you for the detail. <laughs> that's how it actually happened. So it wasn't like, you know, there wasn't like a big sort of, what do they call it? Uh, dos Machina? It wasn't like a big thing that just sort of like landed, you know, CAA didn't just show up and go, oh, that didn't happen. <laughs> it was a little manager and he knew some folks and Lola knew some folks and then everybody loved the script. It all came back to, we like this script. Um, and as I've continued, I've realized it all comes down to that. It all comes down to the words on these pieces of paper. We dig those. So let's see what we can do. That's what it's always come down to, in my experience, so. I think um, because I know so many people who are in the business and, so I guess it would be, is it me now knowing the people that I know or is it me then not knowing anyone? You know, because mm -hmm. that's a different, because I would just, there's actors that I know, there's writers, producers, I would get, and maybe I'd do it the same way anyway, whether I knew them or not. I'd just find someone who did it Right. And or who was in some way in the business and just ask their advice. What do you think I should do? Is there someone? Can, do, can you recommend someone to to read it? Or right. I I also probably because I did this back then again because I didn't know any better. But I still do this now. I would create my own readings. So I had a lot of um, friends anyway. You know, because New York was like that. Not L.A. is kind of like that, but New York. It's a different kind of, um, uh, I don't want to say posse, but friendship pool. Like yeah, you, I've you're heard connected that. to yeah. people. And so when you do a reading or something like that, you get people to come to your reading and it's like a party and that kind of thing. And I did a little bit of that out here, trying to establish that same dynamic. But that really yielded a lot of results when you literally just do a reading of your work. People come, they see it, they, they're like, wow, that was great. And then those people talk to people they know, and it just sort of is a snowball effect. So I would say always, if you're writing or anything like that, you still are in control of putting your stuff out there in some way, shape, or form. And it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It doesn't have to cost anything. So you say almost do like, hey, let's have a wine and cheese at my place and come and read yes, my and script. Kind of I take it a step further. Like, uh, and uh, I wrote a script with my, my best friend sort of like a uh, kind of a road trip girly movie, whatever, but it was really funny, right? So we um, got some of the people that we knew. We told everybody we were gonna do this reading. We cooked, like we cooked f like real food, and we were like, it's gonna be food and drink, and we sort of supplied everything. And it was like packed. It was like literally 150, 200 people, because, and then we started like making that a thing. So people would want, and you know, of course, your stuff has to be at least interesting. <laughs> so well, the food and wine, the food, right? Yeah. So, so it would be those two things, <laughs> and so um, the people would come and be like a big party. You'd meet people, 
you'd have fun, the work is cool, you can talk about that, and then literally we'd have to kick people out, you know, or we'd have it at a theater and they'd be like, okay, you guys have to, you know, because there's food, there's wine, there's creative stuff happening. And in LA especially, we have to create these things for ourselves because it's not as easy to do as it is in New York. Here, people are all over the place and creating a creative group is like, it's not just like a creative thing that you need to feed yourself creatively. It's spiritual, you know, it's like a spiritual food um, and, you know, fellowship. It's like all of that happening at once and people will come to experience that, you know.